Island, this is our typical uh, trail model. Uh, we use the uh, pack ponies, elastic impedance methodology uh, to generate uh, the CI section. Um, the interesting thing in this one, I think, is, is that the very small, subtle changes like being able to choose between reservoir models, conceptual reservoir models, using the uh, elastic impedance, if you like, um, <coughs> harder data than the reservoir model uh, have enabled some, some real upsides in, uh, in if you like, the, the length of um, horizontal that has been achieved. If you look along this upper horizon here, our horizontal was enabled to get in at this point, go all the way along here, right up to, to a crest. Now, if you have taken um, this model here, uh, there's, a, there's a very different uh, attitude get into, into this model. So we've gained something like 500 meters of, uh, of open hole exposure to um, productive sounds in this case, and that, that added up to uh, a very much better hole. So finally, I, I thought I'd uh, wrap up, and I think I'm going to take the time. I thought I'd wrap up with the time lapse uh, example. I think, I think I agree that the time lapse of time has come within the North Sea, where we have um, you know, we have companies that are coming along now and seeking to make um, good money at you know, 40 to maybe $80 a barrel range uh, from old discoveries that they can just put more knowledge base on. Um, maybe put an A team on, maybe, where maybe there was a C team uh, in place in the major because all the bigger discoveries were elsewhere. They can, they can hire in the market, they can hire a, a good group of people, put them together on a small small or medium-sized asset and really sweat that. And we've seen this, you know, this kind of philosophy in the North Sea to some extent with, with talent, talismans and Petra Canada's. We start to see it with the, uh, the oil Escos and uh, other companies, uh, Tarka and companies like this coming in. And I think there's a, there's a, a large secondary market um, away from the majors in the, in the time lapse world. Um, it will depend on us getting better, uh, better seismic information. Uh, we've seen the potential for doing that through uh, a number of the uh, presentations early today. The question then comes is, you know, outside of the large companies, where does the knowledge base lie, uh, the know-how, if you like, to really do this stuff? Because I, I think it has, for a number of years, resided with the large companies. This, as people move, uh, as the software um, develops, and, and we are a software developer in this area, and it's, it does take time to put these things together, uh, put these products together and get them tested in the market. But there are now starting to, to be some, some ways that the uh, independent sector can take advantage of this, at least in the, the subsurface world, where we can move very quickly between the simulator, between the between the inverse model world, between the forward model world, and between the reservoir world. So I think you're going to start to see a faster take-up with the independence of time-lapse technologies. Uh, it has been, has been quite a long coming, I would say. I'm a little bit surprised, but um, I, I do I put it down to this sort of, how long has it taken for that um, diffusion of know-how to come out of the majors? Uh, it's an ongoing process. So a nice example here, this is, um, a tertiary, uh, tertiary reservoir, I can't say which one it is, um, where 20 million barrels worth of uh, you know, low cost targets because they can be, they can be um, cheap from the central drilling platform um, can be targeted with actually very, very high chance of success. So the engineers love this stuff if you can gear it to the like that format. So the summary of I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that. Given what we want to do with geophysics, um, uh, enabling uh, remote knowledge of the rocks, uh, is that seismic attributes on their own are quite valuable, uh, but they, they achieve orders of magnitude more value, um, practical value, when they're linked to the rock properties at the wells uh, and by the, the rock physics. Um, there's now a broader range of tools to measure these rock, the rock properties and rock physics, so we can start to extend the methodology away from what the heterogeneity scales that we were looking at um, in, uh, in core and to some extent wireline, start to look at how whole reservoirs uh, 
behave and how they look uh, geophysically. That's extremely useful. Um, the interpretive community, I think, has has taken the message on board. Um, the rock properties and information. The task has been how do we get it out there so that we've not just got one expert in every every company doing this this kind of area, but every day interpreters can do this in the workflows. That's continuing the process, but it, it adds a huge amount of value. But I think the uh, the overwhelming point uh, here is that we've heard of, in this business, we've come across many silver bullets in, in the past before. AVO was a silver bullet um, and went through two or three iterations before it came, before people became savvy enough to use it. Uh, I think we're very much in that, that uh, period now with EM, um, where there is some value to the technology, but it's been probably been uh, overhyped, if they want to say it. But putting it together with the in the right context could, I think, start to deliver some value. Um, and integration, as always, is the key. So that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, YLSCO, Bridge Gas, Shell, for uh, examples, Robson, for a few examples of the My colleagues are on the side. So thank you. Question. It's, it, it's, a, it's an observation or a comment to one of the remarks you made uh, in the introduction uh, about EM falling into the chasm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I listened to a, a presentation that uh, Dave Pratt gave uh, at a conference in, in, in Norway a couple of months ago, and he tried to portray EM and he, and he, and he basically looked at the 15-year uptake time for 3D sites from when Exxon did the first commercial 3D to when BP did their first commercial 3D. It was actually 15 years, he claimed. So, and so he said if you, if you use the same sort of 15 year time frame to go from first commercial operation to entry into the mainstream, then he thought the market for control source EM, there's enough marketplace for four crews now, and there are currently nine which is why everybody on the EM side that's been used primarily for reducing expiration risk uh, has, is, is struggling so badly that you talked about 10% or less of, of, of share value. But it was just, just a comment that, that there'd been such an over-expectation and an over-supply in the EM service providers, I think there are now nine companies offering some kind of EM, um, that they just really just kill the market. So just, yeah, yeah. Um, um, good. Okay, can you speak loudly too, and then I'll... Bill Lewis, Trick International, I'm also chair of the Technical Standards Committee of the SEG. And just quickly to say that we're working very hard at the moment to make EM data far more accessible by actually including that as well, um, EM data as well as wireless and seabed technology in the new SEG D format 3.0. And anyone who wants to use that format will find that they get a much better uptake for people processing the data, exchanging the data, and utilizing it into the future. And because you'll be able to use the same format for a number of different disciplines, you'll be able to actually integrate data more easily as well. And all of these new formats are actually uh, keeping in line with the OGP work, which is based around the EPSG um, a database of positioning information and coordinates reference system and again by all staying with that same standard you'll be able to integrate data more easily and energistics the um, uh, standards body for well data etc are also following those same guidelines so just as a piece of information if anyone wants any further on it assist <laughs>